Hello, everybody, and welcome to Back to the Future, the podcast. Season 8, we're kicking off this week. Excited to bring you some new episodes of the show. Today on the show, we have the legend himself, James Tolkien. But before we um, get to today's episode, wanted to start off something with, uh, start off this podcast, not something, I wanted to start off this podcast with something special for everyone listening right now. As you know, last year in 2020, we um, over here were excited to announce the release of Back from the Future, a celebration of the greatest time travel story ever told. That came out on hardcover on uh, April 14th, 2020. But I have a special, special announcement for everyone right now. The people over at Mango Publishing were so excited with how the Back to the Future community came around and, 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 and embraced the book, Back from the Future, they wanted me to write some more for it and put it out in a paperback. That's right. I'm here to announce just in time for the holiday season on December the 2nd, 2021, you can get Back from the Future, the paperback edition with a special added chapter called The Time Capsule. And The Time Capsule will have special interviews with people in the Back to the Future universe, galaxy, world. What do we call it? The canon? I don't know. Anyway, they're going to be in there. A special chapter called The Time Capsule will be added with some additional material to every single chapter. Really excited for this to come out on December the 2nd. That's 12 days before your man's birthday. That's a few days. That's 13 days before. 13 days, right? No, no. Uh, 23 days <laughs> before Christmas. Hey, I'm a writer, not a mathematician. Nevertheless, you can go right now on Amazon.com, on Barnes & Noble, whatever your favorite app is uh, or, or retail site to order books. You can get it right now. The pre-order links are in the description of this podcast. Go do it. Go do it right now and get the Back from the Future, a celebration of the greatest time travel story ever told. Go get the paperback Right now, in time for the holidays, it'll be the perfect gift for yourself or for your loved one. Go do it right now, please. I'd appreciate it. Also, while you're listening to this, give the uh, podcast five stars. Do a little review on Apple Podcast. Wherever you listen to podcasts, make sure you do that. And now, without further ado, here is Mr. James Tolkien on Back to the Future, the podcast. Hi, everybody. This is Bob Gale, co-creator of Back to the Future, and you're listening to Brad Gilmore. Oh, Brian, what have you done now, now, now? Doc! 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 Okay, relax, Doc. It's me. It's me. It's Martin. Oh, it can't be. Just sent you back to the future. Yeah. Oh, I know. You did send me back to the future, but I'm back. I'm back from the future. Great. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doc. Huh? Are you telling me that you built a time machine? The way I see it, if you're going to build a time machine into a car, why not do it some style? What is up, everybody? Welcome to Back to the Future, the podcast, the only podcast looking back in time at the greatest film trilogy of all time, Back to the Future. I'm your friend in time, Brad Gilmore. Here we are embarking on season eight of the podcast, working on it. And I'm excited. I'm excited for everybody to be hearing everything I've been working on and the people that I've talked to. This one is awesome. We're talking to Principal Strickland himself. Yes, Vice Principal Strickland, I should say. We're talking to James Tolkien. Yes, James Tolkien is joining me on the show today to discuss his incredible career, his dealings with Back to the Future. How was it reshooting those six weeks after Eric Stoltz exited the project and Michael J. Fox was brought in? Was he hesitant about taking the sequels and much, much more? Um, I wanted to tell quickly before we go into the interview how this came to be because I love how this happened. And I just have to share the story with somebody. I said, who better than the pinhead? So I was trying to figure out what I was going to do for this season of the podcast. James Tolkien's been on my list since 2015 to get on the show. 
did a lot of research, internet research. I was DMing people I didn't even know, going on Facebook, talking to different people, and I found a group. I won't say who they are because I don't want them to get blown up by by with messages, I should say. And um, I, I started reaching out to them, and they said, hey, you know, I, I don't know, but here's an address um, that I know he takes fan mail at. I said, okay. So I wrote James a handwritten note, I don't know, several months ago, and I didn't hear anything back. Then I talked to uh, a f- another castmate from Back to the Future. I reached out to them, and they said, I'll talk to James. And then they sent back correspondence saying his wife said, we got your letter, be in touch. I said, okay, cool. Well, months and months and months go by. I don't hear anything. And a couple weeks ago, I'm doing this in, in June, at the end of June, or July right now, I'm sorry, end of July. A couple weeks go by. I said, you know what? I'm going to send another handwritten note. So I found a like card stock, like, you know, stationary type stuff. I wrote James a two-line note, and I left my number at the end of it. Again, I don't hear anything. I'm watching, I think it was game four of the NBA Finals. It's starting. I'm watching Giannis. I'm watching Chris Paul. Phone goes off. It's a number I don't recognize. Rarely do I answer these. But I was I had my phone in my hand, so I just said, hello. And I hear, yeah, Brad. I was like, yes, speaking. And they go, Brad, this is Jim. And I said, oh, okay. Hey, uh, hey, Jim. I had no idea who was on the other line. And then he goes, it's Jim Tolkien. I said, Jim Tolkien. Hey, how are you doing, sir? And he's like, I'm great. I got your letter ready to do the interview. When do you want to do it? And I'm like, uh, whenever. He said, call me Monday. So I called him Monday. He said, can we do it tonight? I said, uh, yeah, let's do it. So I let go of my radio responsibilities as soon as I got off the air. Gave him a call. Actually, he called me two minutes before the interview time. And you're about to hear the conversation that I had with the awesome legend himself, Mr. James Tolkien, otherwise known. The Vice Principal Strickland from Back to the Future and Marshall Strickland from Back to the Future Part 3. Here we go. Check it out. And he joins me now. The absolute legend himself is on the line, Mr. James <laughs> Tolkien. Mr. Tolkien, how are you doing, sir? Well, I'm doing great. I'm, I'm pleased to be speaking with you, Brad, finally. Uh, yeah, I am so thrilled that I had this opportunity. It's something that I've really wanted to do for a long time uh, to be able to... Well, here we are. Well, here he- we are. Great. Wonderful. Here we are. Great. Wonderful. Well, it, I, 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 again, we'll start right now with this. I called you a, a legend, and, and you absolutely are. You've had some of the, some iconic roles from some of the most iconic movies of all time. Can we just start into your journey as an actor? Where, where did it first start for you? Were you on the stage? before the screen you know kind of what oh, was your no. origin story well um after i got after i got out of the navy i went back to school and i went to Coe college in cedar rapids iowa and then to there i got interested in acting and after two years of at co and i had a lot of uh, affirmation about what i was doing i transferred to the university of iowa which had a big theater department and at iowa i learned uh Oh, it, you know, they said if you're if you're serious about being an actor, you got to go to New York and study, and uh, study with either Lee Strasberg or Stella Adler. So I wanted to study with Stella Adler at that time. So uh, in 1956, I got in a Greyhound bus out of Iowa City. I had $75 in my pocket. I didn't know a soul in New York, and I got on that Greyhound bus to go to New York to be an actor. Oh my God! If I didn't know what I was getting into. When I arrived in New York, I was scared to death, and oh, I had to find some place to live, and I, I, I did that, and my money ran out, and I had to get, after six years of college, I'm working as a busboy on Central Park South, and um, it was very challenging at first, but it was really the greatest time in my life because it was full of promise and possibilities, and uh, I'm so glad I left that. I felt even though I had a lot of life experience, I uh, when I when I got to New York, I, I felt like I was a relative hick, and uh, I had so much to learn. And I, I, um, I, I was challenged. That I it was it was so great. It was just so great. My first apartment in New York, I finally found a place. You could get a cold water flat back then. It was a fifth floor walk up, three rooms, steam heat and hot water, and my rent was. Twenty-five dollars and thirteen cents a month, which was just perfect. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, right. And um, 
so I was, uh, I, I, I had an interview with Stella Adler and I had enough money to get started with her. And, um, it was, it was just the best, the best time in my life because of just, it was just like so challenging, so, uh, so wonderful. And as, as I said before, the possibilities were, you know, there. So anyway, that's how I, that's, that was my first start in New York City. And it's been, it's been great. Well, I, I mean, um, yeah. No, no, I mean, continue, continue. I don't mean to cut you off. No, no, I, I mean, I'm, I'm talking a lot now. Uh, that, that, I, I just want to say that my first, uh, I just talked about my first little apartment in New York for 15, uh, for uh, $25 or 13 cents. And when I left New York, when I decided to live up here in Lake Placid, and I'm, I'm, I'm out of the business, I uh, was living in a, uh, a beautiful uh, penthouse in Tribeca. So I feel like I'm a success. <laughs> it, it's one well, some way or another I'm a success. But I'm, it's been so great. It's been it, it's I've, I've I've endured everything. I've I've experienced so many things, positive, negative, and uh, I'm I'm here and uh, now I'm I'm enjoying the good life now, and I I I feel strong because I uh, I made it all through through all that. Well, as, as I say, the good times are the bad times. The good and bad is how you have to take it through life. Obviously, every industry is going to have its challenges. For you, though, you know, like you said, you, your your bank account ran out of money at some point. You're in this <laughs> you're in this apartment. When when for you? Because yeah. you had several several credits uh, dating back to the early 1960s. When did you feel like you had made it as an actor? Was there a particular role? Was there a particular film where you said, "Okay, now I feel oh. like I've made this." Oh well, I you know I I really had some great experiences. Uh, at one point, I replaced Robert Duvall in in uh, Arthur Miller's play *View from the Bridge*, and that was very important for me. I I feel like that was really special. And right after that, I auditioned for uh, Arthur Penn to understudy Robert Duvall in *Wait Until Dark*, and that was on Broadway with Lee Remick, and it was a big production. And after two weeks, uh, 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 in the playing after New York, after went into the open to New York, two weeks, Robert Duvall broke his hip in a riding accident, and suddenly I was on. And it went, it went beautifully, and they cast me in the role, the lead, the, the, the part of Harry Roth, the killer, and waited until dark. And I played that part for two years, and I, I kind of felt that that was an important, uh, an important event, you know. There, there, there have been others, but that was kind of a, kind of the first one. Uh, you know, obviously Robert Duvall, one of the one of the greatest actors of all time, and to be able to work with him as, as the understudy, and then go on to replace him, that had to have been almost mind blowing for you at the time, huh? No, I not really. At the, at the time, I felt like I felt that hey, I'm just as good but, you know, <laughs> as you should. <laughs> but but that's but that was just you know he he's so special, he's so great. Yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah. One one of the most incredible actors, like I said. Now, um, going into film, were you nervous of trying to make that transition? There have been a lot of theater actors trying to, you know, go into film and television. Some more successful than others. Did you find that that was going to be? I guess when you were still on stage, did you think that was going to be the route you would take? No, I I, no, I always wanted to be in movies, but I was a stage actor, and that's where all my experience was. And I worked for years in the theater in New York, doing re and regional theater all over the country. And my, I was most at home with the boards under my feet, if you understand what I mean. And I, uh, I was quite uh, nervous about the transition because it's a totally different thing. And um, I, the first couple of things, I did small parts of movies, I was very nervous. But I had the privilege of working in 1973 with Sidney Lumet in, in. Uh, Reciprocal, and that was a special. I, I had a not a big part, but a, a, a memorable part in that. And when I finished that, he told me next time it'll be something much more. And in 1979, I think it was, we did uh, Prince of the City, and uh, that that was that was that was special. When you work with Sidney Lumet, you you you're spoiled for every other movie director because he 
he rehearses three weeks in advance. So when you get to the when you get on the set and you start shooting, everybody knows their job. He, he likes to get everything in one take, and he often does. And you go home every day at four thirty, and he comes in ahead of schedule, saves a lot of money. But the thing of, he's just so wonderful with actors. He just he just spoils he spoils you for everyone else. But uh, you know, I uh, then let's see. Oh yeah, I I got a call from uh, Robert Zemeckis when I was doing. I was doing uh, with Gary Glenn Ross, a David Mamet play on Broadway, mm -hmm. and that was a very special experience. But I got a call from uh, from Mamet, and he asked me to come and do Back to the Future. I didn't know about Back to the Future. I didn't know who he was. And I said, I, I've always said, I'm never going to Hollywood until they send for me. And I said, I figured this is my chance. So I, and I, I found out that I was the only actor in Back to the Future who did not audition, which uh, I think he must have seen me in something and thought I was okay. So he, 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 so he hired me, and I went out to do Back to the Future. Then I did Top Gun. I did all kinds of stuff, television, several movies. And um, I, I, I had a good time out there. I, I, I lived 15 minutes to the beach. Any day I wasn't working, to get on my bike, go for a swim, play tennis uh, the, uh, near, the, uh, the, near the ocean. And living the good life, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, right. At, and uh, at a certain point, I had enough of that, and uh, I decided I was going to retire. But even in, in retirement, I, I did a lot of work. I don't know if you saw anything uh, with, with Timothy Hutton uh, when we did a, a thing about um, in, in what was that in Canada? I'm trying to think of the name uh, of the name of the uh, show. We did it for two years, and that was after I was supposed to have been retired. So, and then things come up; things still come up, you know. So. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you I mean you're obviously still a fixture. We we saw you recently, even on the Discovery Channel for their expedition back to the future. One one quick thing though, before I ask you about Back to the Future, was um, going from the the stage to the screen. Um, when you're a live theater actor. You have that audience. You have that instant feedback. You can feel if a scene's working, feel if your line delivery is working, because the crowd's going to exactly. give you that feedback. When you're on the set, you're not getting that. How did you adapt to that? <laughs> you just you just hope it's working. And that's all, <laughs> you know, because because you you do not have that. You don't have that instant uh, response, audience response. But uh, you, you you get a it's uh, it's so dependent on the director. The director can make it really easy for you when you're doing film, or he can make it kind of difficult, depending, just depending. And I, you know, I did some TV out there. I, I, I don't like doing TV. I did one good show at t uh, TV. I really liked uh, the, um, the uh, with uh, Pierce Brosnan. The Remington Steel. Yeah, Remington Steel. I li I liked what I did there, but I did a lot of junk too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah absolutely well, well to, to ask you about back to the future you brought up an interesting fact that you didn't audition for the film um you know yeah. the, 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 it's a legendary story of there was a different marty mcfly at first that was per portrayed by eric stoltz uh, michael j fox exactly. then replaced him what did you find that difficult to have to shoot all of your scenes over again no i found it easier because everything was rewritten and it was re and, and it was tighter writing and it was better so uh, I, th I thought it was a big improvement. And once Michael J. Fox showed up, he was so graceful and easy. It just he, he it was it was just it was a, it was a different show. Yeah, I mean, he it, obviously brought a levity to it. I think that that uh, from what I read, you know, that is really what made all the writing click was his reactions to the, his surroundings. Um, you playing Vice Principal Strickland, which is such a famous role. Um, for yeah. yourself, obviously, I'm sure that people yeah. come up to you all the time and say, "Call me a slacker," and then things. That's, that, that is correct, and I get ton, I still get tons of fan mail and from all over the world, believe it or not. That you, I uh, twice, two or three times a year, I have to hire somebody to answer these uh, these letters. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's been amazing because Strickland was not that big a role. But it made an impression. What should I say? Well, I think when you look at the 
the the the film and outside of the the main roles of you know Biff, Marty, Lorraine, Doc, um, yeah. and George, yeah. Principal Strickland, Vice Principal Strickland is is the most iconic of those roles, and I think the most important character because in all the films, uh, you, you play a pivotal role in how the story ends up playing out, whether it be taking of the almanac or or what have you. Um, what what yeah. what did you, who did you think that guy was Strickland when you read when you read the sides for the character? Who did I think it was? Yeah, well, did you base it on anybody? I, <laughs> I, I, I just I based it on a on a certain character element of my own of my own in myself. So you kind of identified maybe with I don't know some of it because I'm sure coming from the military, um, uh, as you did, you were used to a certain amount of structure, and that seems to be what Strickland's main thing was. What is was he wanted structure and order? Did you have to tap into any of that? You're absolutely correct. That's right. Um, yeah. you, you mentioned though that um, a- after the film came out, obviously it was it was massive, the biggest film in 1985. You went on to do yeah. Top Gun after that with Tom Cruise, who's arguably yeah. still the biggest movie star in the world. Um, yes. And yeah. and then you had these two massive movies back to back. Did you think that that was going to be how it kept going? That you were just going to be in these massive blockbusters year after year? <laughs> No, I just, I, I thought, well, hey, it's Hollywood. Anything could happen. So uh, I just, I, I really, I should have got home after those two movies. <laughs> but I stayed, but I stayed out for another maybe eight or nine years and I stayed busy and uh, I enjoyed it out there. But I knew my time in Hollywood was limited, that it was not the place for me. And, you know, this, <laughs> the friend of mine once said, you know, when you start to hate the palm trees, it's time to go home. <laughs> that's the greatest quote I think I've ever heard about California. When you start oh, to eat yeah. the palm trees, it's time to go to Lake Placid. Um, when, let that's me ask you right. this: when, when they yeah. when when they did the sequels for Back to the Future and they gave you the call, um, was there any apprehension about joining back up and and doing that oh. again? Oh, and none of it, it was a it was a privilege each time because to work with these guys, Bob Rusebeka, Bob Gale. The so special. The writing was so good, and they were so wonderful to work with. It was a great. It was an honor and a pleasure. And I guess you probably enjoyed getting to do kind of a variant of the character in the third film, playing the marshal uh, in the old west. Was was that a fun time as well? Uh, yes, that was great. I just you know I thought it was so much fun, and uh, to, to be Marshal Strickland, the uh, the uh, granddaddy of all these other guys. Uh, <laughs> Sure, it, it was it was it was great. Um, you you mentioned, uh, and, and and I really want to appreciate your time. Um, we're we're about wrapped up here, but I just wanted to say. So you mentioned you have all these fan letters, and 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 I'm a fan of yours. I I've been a fan of yours the entirety of my life. I've quoted you and referenced you <laughs> umpteenth time. So it's almost a, uh, a otherworldly experience to have a privilege to share some time with you. But um, have you had a specific fan interaction? over the years that it was really special to me or was there really just too or special to you or was there just too many to count as far as fans are concerned yeah it's 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 basically top gun and back to the future that those are the two movies although i must say when i do these uh uh comic cons people mm-hmm. come up with stuff that i forgot i'd done that they want me to sign <laughs> so, sometimes sometimes there's 15 12 or 15 items i have to sign from one, one, you know, it, it, it amazes me constantly. I, in many ways, I wish they would spend their money more smartly, but if that's important to them, that's fine. My final question for you, sir, is you've yeah, had yeah. an incredible career. Obviously, you're now li- living uh, the, the better side of, of, of life, being able to enjoy the fruits of your labor. To all the, uh, living the, living the good yeah, life, living. right? Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah. To all the aspiring, though, actors who want to have a similar career for yours to work for several decades on the stage and screen, what would be the biggest piece of advice you could give them? You know, it's so difficult. To, because there are no rules. There are no rules about how to go about it. There are, people go about it in different ways. And what, what works for one actor is not going to work for another. It's so I, I can't really put anything in, in, into a scheme of how to go about it. It's just you got to dive in and be committed and uh, just commit yourself that you want to do this and that you're going to do this. 
that's all I can say. Well, I think that's it. tremendous advice, sir, and and I really do, again, appreciate your time here spending with me and just giving me a little bit of insight on some of your most yeah. famous roles and, and how you got to the position you are today living the good <laughs> life that is the legendary yeah. James Tolkien. James, I appreciate you so much, sir. Oh, it's my pleasure, Brad. Thank you so much. All right, and you know what? It wouldn't, it wouldn't be an interview if – could you call me a slacker one time? Brad, Brad you're a slacker, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> that is the legendary James Tolkien. James, thank you so much. Bye-bye. And there you have it. There you have it. The man himself, James Tolkien, on Back to the Future, the podcast. Still can't believe that I got it in the bag, 90 years of age, and what an absolute treat. That is all we have for you today. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast. More episodes of Season 8 of Back to the Future, the podcast, are on the way. If you haven't checked out our back library, Seasons 1 through 7, incredible stuff with some of the biggest and best in the world of Hill Valley. Until next time, I'm your friend in time, Brad Gilmore, and I will see you in the future.